How do you work the clicker? Okay. Uh, join my colleagues. First of all, I'm thanking them for staying within 10 minutes. I guess I'll have to as well. Uh, note the disclaimer on the bottom. This is a, uh, a CSIS team led by Clark Murdoch. I had great partners, Ryan Crotty, Vince Manzo, and Josie Gable. And thanks CSBA for arranging all of this. I found it a very productive enterprise. Uh, strong but selective, a more self-interested United States, uh, perhaps also known as Tom Donnelly's greatest nightmare. <laughs> um, the first issue that I want to underscore here is this is a strategy. It's a strategy-driven cut drill. So the first thing you have to do is establish the strategy, strategic principles, and then apply them. And that's what we did. This doesn't mean that we recommend, because no one would recommend these kind of draconian cuts with the amount of risk associated with them. But these are the kind of cuts you have to make to make the numbers. And that's what's in the law. And so part of this is underscoring to people that if we don't change where we are now, these are the kind of alternative scenarios you're looking at. Uh, principal differences from the 2012 DSG, um, I'm very much of a team player. Those were my instructions to take it as a departure point. First thing we did, strategic retreat from the Middle East while maintaining the defense of Israel. Can't get to the cuts you, kind of, you need without cutting three carriers from the force and changing the composition of the carriers as they're in the Asia Pacific. And BPC, building partnership capacity, uh, it's a phrase one of my colleagues first used, count me a skeptic BPC. I don't know how you can build partnership capacity when no one is spending any more money, they're spending less money. My feeling is, is by self-interested, I mean pulling the American security blanket back a little bit so that our allies who can afford it start paying more for their own defense, which means that the strategic retreat from the Middle East, yes, a US strategic retreat, but the Europeans who live right there are the ones who have to start providing for their own security. A little more detail in the priority mission areas. I want to talk about key rebalancing assumptions uh, like CSBA, or rather CSBA like we did six months ago when we first did the drill. You make all your ads first. We increased our bill by about $200 billion, plused up S&T, plused up space, plused up Comms. In most cases, we did it to the max because what we did is had the plus ups, then we went for our first round of cuts, then we went back and revisited the personnel, did a little bit more in the way of personnel cuts, then revisited our ads because they were too expensive and moderated our appetites a little bit, then came back and made the final personnel cuts that got us where we are. But it was the personnel cuts you had to go to again and again in order to get to where you needed to be. Tiered readiness across the services, move a lot of the capacity for large ground operations into the reserves. Cut anything that had BPC on it. You know, you have to go through these drills pretty quickly, and each one of them was coded for the kind of uh, thing that it was, so if the letter BPC appeared there, it was gone. The kind of challenging generation, you know, we might go into some ungoverned areas, retain a bit of training in that capacity, but I'm not going to spend any money training allies who aren't going to spend any money on their equipment. Maintain and reshape SOF as a global manhunting force. What we did essentially is get rid of all of the civil affairs, what left was in the reserves, did no reconstruction, not much nation building in this force. This is a hard power force. Uh, we tried to increase combat power, as our CSBA colleagues did, but we focused on being the coercive element of U.S. national strategy. We're the stick behind coercive diplomacy. We invested in BRAC, even though it cost us money, because we agree. If you're going to make the kind of personnel cuts we're talking about, you have to do BRAC. At some point, it becomes even too silly for Congress not to do BRAC. Moved active BCTs into the reserves, took us two moves, because you have to cut them during move one and then you added them to the reserves in the second one. Uh, as a couple of the other teams did, we plussed up marine readiness because they are 9-11, post 9-11 readiness force. They are the ones you call, 911. 
uh, we kept the Air Force pretty ready because they have to support the Marines and their kind of activities, and they're also the high-end stop force, hold force that we talked about before. This is the actual process. I've sort of gone through that. This is our summary chart. Uh, again, it shows the extent to which we took the personnel cuts. It shows a lot of green uh, in that because we did a lot of reshaping of the force. Uh, but in addition to taking 16 BCTs out of the active army, putting 10 back into the reserve component, this is about a 40% cut in the Air Force's tactical air tactical aviation. Next slide. Again, I talked about the priority capabilities that, um, that we plussed up. I wanted to mention national missile defense. Big believers in that, not investing more in the current generation, but rather putting the investment in the next generation ground-based interceptor. You've got to do homeland defense. If you don't do homeland defense, we're going to be out of the power production game during that time. So more on national missile defense. Yes, we'll provide theater missile defenses, but only if the Allies pay for it. After all, they're the theater. It's their defense we're talking about. Major trade-offs, I think we've talked about them, modernization over personnel, readiness over personnel, division of labor between the services. When you have these kind of severe cuts, you have to address what we used to call roles and missions issue. I don't think we'd even call them now because I haven't done any of them so long. Areas to accept risk, we've talked about that, but I want to underscore the point that my colleagues have made. There are clearly significant strategic risks to withdrawing from the Middle East. I'm willing to defend that proposition, but there are severe risks, and do you want to do it to the extent that you have to because of these BCA cuts? I would argue no, but that's what you have to do if you're going to make the numbers. Again, the thanks, but I repeat again after the disclaimer, this is not a CSIS strategy. This is the implications of implementing the kind of draconian cuts that we're talking about uh, in the Budget Control Act of 2011. Thank you.